Welcome back. When it comes to making these reviews, the ones I always have the most fun creating are of the watches that are a bit different. Now they have something that I haven't quite seen before, such as a new type of dial, a new movement, or even an entirely new brand. And the watch we're going to look at today has all three of those. First off, it's from Solus, a brand new microband based out of Ireland. And it's named the Starlight because of the adventuring dial it uses. But for me, the most interesting thing about it is its movement, as this is the first micro rotor movement I've seen. And it's this movement that is key to understanding how both Solus and the Starlight came to be. Usually micro rotor movements are sort of in-house specialties for a handful of luxury brands. And as a result of that rarity, there are a few collectors who really obsess about one day owning one. And one of those is the man behind Solus, DU. Now, Hangzhou created this movement, which is the 5000A, a few years ago, and that opened up the possibility of someone creating an affordable watch with a micro rotor movement. So, DU, as well as some other enthusiasts, kept waiting for someone to actually do that, but no one really took up that challenge. So, DU decided to do it himself, and thus Solus was born. Now, this specific watch is not the final version. It was created in preparation for a Kickstarter, and I got to borrow it for a few weeks. So as always in these types of situations, there may be some differences in the final version and the one we're going to look at today. Now, this intro is already kind of long, but there's one more thing we have to talk about before we get into it, which is that this is one of the hardest watches I've ever had to film. So some of these shots are going to be much better than others as I only had it for a limited amount of time, and it kind of took me a while to really dial in to the point where I was happy with it. The problem is really twofold here. One, this adventuring dial is really reflective, so you need just the right amount of light, otherwise it starts to kind of look like a disco ball. The second is the Delphine hands, and these are really just reflective strips of metal, so in a dark room, they're just going to reflect that darkness. So I had to get just the right amount of glare to show off those hands, but not so much that it muddies the whole look. The reason I'm telling you this is that while those features do affect the usability and visibility in the real world, they are much more exaggerated here. And especially in some of these shots where I'm trying to show you something specific, and especially the macro shots. So I thought it'd be best to show you right here just a couple of shots that come closest to the real world. And then just keep these in mind as you go through the rest of the review. So with regard to size, the Starlight is 38 millimeters without and 40 millimeters with a crown, as well as a moderate sized lug to lug of 44 and a half. So for everyone that complains about watches 40 millimeters or larger, this is one to take note of. And as for everyone else, well, it's still a good size and more importantly, a very comfortable size for a dress watch. Along those same lines, it's also very thin, coming in at just under 10 millimeters, And that's from the very, very open exhibition case back to the top of the sapphire crystal with AR, which is ideal if you're wearing longer sleeves, jackets, or suits. Now, the dial here isn't the only thing that loves to play with the light, as every surface and every angle of the case here has a high polish to it. The finishing is good, and the overall case shape is a bit roundish, kind of acting more like a frame for the dial underneath. Although the natural curvature of that case is interrupted by the slim and slender lugs, as they protrude out just slightly and away, which from a side profile almost give this case a bit of an art deco feel. At the three, you have a smaller sign crown and one that shows off a Celtic inspired logo. And I think it looks really good on that crown. Now, the crown isn't screw down, which really isn't surprising for a dress watch, as you're only looking at 50 meters of water resistance here, but that is to be expected. The very wide and open exhibition case back is simply gorgeous. Not only does it show off the micro rotor underneath, but I just love the additional text around the case back in Irish. It's kind of a small thing. But I think that, combined with the Celtic logo, really give the watch a touch of character by just subtly highlighting its Irish roots. Now, as long as we're looking at it, we might as well talk more about the movement. As I mentioned earlier, micro-rotor movements are kind of a specialty item. 
Even used, you're looking at prices in the thousands, if not tens of thousands. Which is why the Starlight is so interesting. As far as I know, it's the first watch with a micro rotor movement that I'd even begin to consider to be affordable. Which again, as far as I know, is because this is the first watch to utilize this movement. Which is the Hangzhou 5000A. Now obviously I'm no expert in these, but the way I look at a micro rotor movement is that it's an attempt to combine the convenience of an automatic with the beauty of a mechanical by just not hiding that movement with the rotor. So not only is the rotor shrunk down, but it's then pushed into the same plane as the rest of the movement, rather than sit on top like a normal automatic, which as a side benefit should make the movement thinner. Now obviously there are going to be some negatives here as well, I mean otherwise everyone would do it, and mainly you're going to look at a more complicated design and manufacturing process, which also means a higher price tag. Although even with all that, the specs are pretty much what you'd expect in this price range. It's high beat, has a 42 hour power reserve, and has hand winding. But there's no hacking, which is a little bit of a letdown. Meanwhile, spec accuracy is just okay. As according to the manufacturer, it should be between plus or minus 20 seconds a day. Which overall isn't too bad, but hopefully they can do some regulating before it gets to the end user. Now, I only had the watch for a few weeks, but my overall impression of the movement was positive. The only odd thing I noticed was that the ticking was a little louder than I expected. And I think it goes without saying, but it is simply beautiful to look at. They did a really good job on the finish, and I do like the custom rotor. The only thing I thought was missing might have been some blued screws. Now, as I said, this is the first watch to use this movement which does beg the question, why is this the first? And I think that's because it's a risk to do so. I mean, if you think about it, if you make a watch in this price range, most people are going to expect an Eta or Salida movement, and definitely not a Chinese Hangzhou. So it's not only safer, but potentially smarter to do so from a business standpoint to just use a standard Swiss Auto. But if the Solus had that, it'd be a whole lot less interesting. And the thing to remember is that this is a bit of a passion project, so it's not really about playing it safe. Yet, I think that perfectly highlights why the movement is the watch's greatest strength and weakness, as it really is an unknown quantity with no long-term track record for reliability. Not to mention that for some people, 370 to 420 is just way too much to pay for a watch with a Chinese movement. And if this was just any normal low-end Chinese movement, I'd be right with you. But this, this is kind of a unique situation, as there really is no alternative near this price. So just something to think about there. But for now, let's move on to the Aventurine dial which is also something you don't normally see in this price range. Now, this particular dial is a man-made stone, and just due to the process, they're all going to be slightly different, with no two exactly alike. And as you can see, I did have a hard time filming this. So this is definitely a watch you have to see in person to truly appreciate. It's more subtle than you might think, and really does look like a starry night mostly black with a touch of blue and just the occasional hint of light. Although the dial is a bit reflective in its own right, and in most lighting conditions there is some amount of glare. So I'm not sure if more AR coating would help, but might be something to look into. Even if they don't, in most lighting conditions it's still a great looking watch. But it's simply stunning when the light hits it just right. And I think it goes without saying that this kind of dial isn't going to be for everyone, so just kind of go with your gut instincts when you see it, as a lot of people just feel more comfortable with a simple sunburst black, blue, or white. The overall design is a bit simplistic, as I think it really relies on the wow factor of that adventuring, which to be fair, wow it does have. And sitting on top of that, you do have applied indices which are these sharp metallic angular triangles. And according to Solus's site, they're shaped that way to resemble the accent mark on some Irish vowels. The indices are also not very tall, so a little bit more depth would be nice. 
but only if they could do that without increasing the thickness of the watch. The next prominent feature on the dial is the metallic ring that holds the sub-second hand, which is then followed by the framing for the date. Now, a date on a dress watch is something I go back and forth on. Generally, I feel if the movement has it, you might as well use it rather than cover it up. So I'm perfectly okay with it being there, and I actually think the three o'clock position is good for it. But the framing around it is another story, and I think it's not only distracting, but a bit odd looking. So I'd be curious to see a render if they just took that out and had a simple cutout, as I think that black date wheel would just blend into the dial better. The hands are a Daphne style, and they are one of the reasons this watch is so hard to shoot. I mean, basically they're just reflective metal, so in this sort of situation, they're just going to reflect back either the lens or the darkness around you, which then causes them to just blend into the background. So while it might not look like it in a lot of these shots, but in person, it's actually pretty easy to read, as there was usually enough contrast to pick out the hands from the dial. Plus, the angular hand shape I think really works well with those sharper indices. At the top of the dial, you do have the brand name, and it's applied in a rather stylized font. Now, as a whole, I do like it, as it's not overly large, and I really like how the polished metal looks on the Aventurine. But there is something kind of off about it. For some, I think it's going to be this playful font. But for me, I think it has more to do with the positioning as it's either too high up, or maybe there's just something with it in the sub-second dial that throws off the symmetry. And last, but certainly not least, we have this at the very bottom of the dial, which translates to designed in Ireland. So once again, a nice touch, and something you don't see very often. As of right now, the Starlight will come with a nice two-piece black leather strap. It's more of a rustic cut, but style-wise I think it works and I really do love this blue threading near the watch. Now, the strap is made in Ireland, but the leather itself actually comes from the United States, as it's Horween leather, which I've always been impressed with. It's pretty hard to go wrong with Horween. So overall, it's a really good strap, and another nice touch is that it comes with an Omega-style deployant clasp. Some deployant clasps I've used tend to bother my wrist after a bit, but I think this is a good one, as it was always very comfortable, and especially with that very flexible Horween. Put them together, and the watch sits squarely and easily conforms to my 7-inch wrist. So overall, really good, but I think there is one potential issue. For my 7-inch wrist, I was on the second to last hole, so I think it is a little short. But since the campaign is just starting, there's plenty of time to provide a longer strap or maybe even have a choice of what size you want. As a whole, it's a very interesting and compelling design. It's not for someone that wants something simpler that'll just blend into whatever they're wearing, yet it's not so loud that it ever becomes a distraction. I think the Starlight is a watch that's subtle enough that someone could walk by you and not even notice it. But if it does happen to catch their eye, then I think it's one where the more you look at it, the more captivated by it you become. However, with the Starlight, I don't think just liking the design is going to be enough to get people to jump on board. Here, it's just as much about the idea behind it, and specifically that movement, as much as the design itself. So to say that it's kind of a niche product is kind of an understatement. You're going to have to find someone who loves the entire concept of the watch before I think they're going to join that Kickstarter. But I think there's enough people out there who are curious enough to do just that. And personally, I would love it if they succeed, just so I can see this movement used more and more in the future. But as always, let me know down below what you think of the Solus Starlight. And specifically, what do you think about this movement? And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for joining me.